Thank you. Uh, so I just want to share something. I came from a family of lawyers. Uh, my father's lawyer, my brother, and you know, uncles, everyone. So when I was growing up, I said to my dad, okay, I'll also become a lawyer. And he said, no, you're not good at that. So you better not be a lawyer. Why, why don't you take science? And so I took up science, and uh, that was uh, perhaps the turning point, uh, because once I took up science, and I realized that I actually really enjoy that a lot more than if I had done law, uh, I was able to devote my entire life to it. And so what happened was that I went, did my master's in robotics, and got to work on some absolutely awesome uh, robotic cars, if I could say that. So here's some of the stuff that I was able to do. First was uh, something of a driverless car, which was uh, you know precursor to a Google car. It could drive to hundreds of miles in desert without any human input. Second was doing a autonomous tank, which is again, you know, uh, a bit of a, not a car, but, it, but another vehicle that could drive by itself. And then I got to work on UAVs, defense robots. So I said, wow, this is, this is really amazing, and I want to continue this. But how, how can I bring this technology back here? So I thought about that objective, and certain things came to my mind. First was that, uh, isn't the slide moving? OK. So yeah, OK, apart from that, I got some good recognitions doing that, both from US defense as well as Indian government, which is always good to have you know, if you're in, in that field. But I thought of my objective while coming back here was, how can I bring, bring this technology over here? Because it, it's really needed here. What all places can it be applied? And how can I create more people like me, in the sense that I felt I was extremely lucky first to get into science and then to get to do what I was doing. And so I realized, but, but a lot of you can come up and do something similar if you started at an early stage. So with those objectives, uh, we founded this company, Omnipresent Robot Tech, and we tried to address some of the problems that India is facing. And so we thought our robots should have a mass impact in India. They should have some intelligence, you know, so they shouldn't be just dumb, dumb machines. Uh, we must make them in India, and we must empower people like you to create them here. So with that objective, we started building some of these robots. So as you can see on top, there's a UAV drone called Hansa which is uh, meant to survey our borders. Then on the bottom, you can see a bomb disposal robot. And then on the right is something close to my heart, is a robot, the river cleaning robot. And this is something we took up on our own when uh, I grew up in Delhi near Yamuna River. And I realized it was so polluted. It was uh, you know, like a, a literally a, a, you know, if I could call it a stinking nala. And so we, we decided we should try to clean it ourselves. And so we came up with, uh, with this technology called Robot. Yeah, so Robot is an autonomous uh, river cleaning robot, which can go into rivers, lakes, and has a robotic arm. It can lift up different types of stuff that's in the river. So for example, you could have polythenes, plastic bags, <laughs> bamboo and where's the volume and a lot of other types of stuff it can lift another thing that we've done on this is we've added a machine vision based recognition algorithm so we are able to recognize a rock or a grass or a bamboo and behave differently in order to pick it up so I'll just let the video play a little well, you can watch how it's performing. So we, we realized in the river there are, there's narrow stuff, there's wide stuff. So we, we must be able to pick up all different types of stuff to be able to clean it. 
Incidentally, right now, the way river cleaning is done is that a bunch of people just go there and try to do it manually, which I think is completely unviable. And, you know, if it had to happen that way, it would, it would have happened in last 10 years. So uh, we built this technology with that function in mind. If you can see, there is, uh, you know, white stuff uh, and there's uh, narrow bamboo-like stuff. Another thing we re we've done is we have a full optical zoom camera on it to see different types of stuff that's in the river. Uh, we also noticed that there's water high in the, in the rivers. So we are able to drag those and bring them uh, closer to a river bank. So once the mission of the robot is complete, it's able to come back to its bank where somebody can uh, you know, clean the waste basket or give it to a recycling agency. Uh, we believe that if we use a system of about 50 such robots in a city like Delhi, we should be able to clean the river in quick time. We've also integrated this drone with our robot so that the drone can actually s tell you where exactly, uh, what type of uh, uh, pollutant is. We have GPS mission planning as well on it, so that we can plan a mission without a human being uh, actually operating it all the time. So I'll just move on from the river cleaning robot and tell you another technology which we think is very useful for India. That's our intelligent quadcopter Garun. And Garun, apart from being a drone, has some cognition capability in, in some sense. So for example, we've done things like detecting uh, an anomaly of human uh, or a traffic and send an alert to a security agency. And we'll try to do a quick demo for you folks uh, with this. And my pilot, Jitender, he's going to fly this for us. Pretty good morning. Erica, good morning to you. We're right at the edge of where the fire stopped. I want you to take a look at this devastation behind me. You're going to see burned out cars. The firefighters still working to make sure all the smoldering flames are out completely. We're seeing little pockets of flames still pop up here and there. See this home has been completely flattened. This is a scene that has been repeated dozens of times throughout this neighborhood. Parts of San Bruno, California, were turned into a raging inferno around dinner time Thursday evening. Uh, flames roared some 60 feet. So we, in the we're air doing a demonstration here to see to tell you what can be done. Uh, can we have the volume Francisco's down? Were engulfed. So if you see what we, what we are trying to do here is we showed a video of fire and the drone actually detects it in its live view and will pop up a location where the fire is detected and will also send you a SMS and an email on your mobile that a fire is detected. So for example, uh, right now it's at, at Geetam University over here. And so if you can imagine this drone flying, say in a refinery, an oil refinery, and, the, and a fire just pops up there, then we'll be able to, within 15 seconds, we'll be able to send a message to the security officer that there's a fire, please go ahead, do something about it. So that way, you know, we are able to do end-to-end -end on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on this quadcopter. So let's get back to the, the presentation. So that was about a couple of examples of what these dro uh, drones or robots can do. You know, sometimes they uh, they can uh, be very helpful to us. But uh, the other objective that I had in mind was how can we empower people like you folks to be able to build these robots? And the first thing that came to my mind was that what exactly is a robot? And to me, robot is a machine that has become alive. And so you know, you could have computers that are sitting in your room, but if, but if there's a machine which really behaves as if it was alive, then I would call it a robot. And so, for example, if the drone actually detects a fire, sends me a message, 
I'll feel like, oh, it's like I have a messenger in the sky that's actually doing something for me. So, so how do we create robots with a little bit of life? And so when I looked at what some of the students uh, in college were using uh, to build these robots, if I can have uh, one of those here. Uh, yeah. So I realized that uh, usually the first robot that if some of you have built might look like this. And it's, it's a jumble of wires and what happens that you will probably spend a semester or an entire year just trying to make a, some small line follower or a, a wall or obstacle detector type robot. And even after this, it may not work. So we realized that people aren't really making robots. They're just trying to fix problems in an electronic circuit. So we said, let's do away with this and let's put every, make everything plug and play. So we made everything plug and play. You could plug your sensors, motors, everything goes on the board as if it was a plug and play thing. And then we challenged students for as young as eight year olds to build a robot and we challenged that you'll be able to do this in 30 minutes, even if you don't have any programming experience. And we challenged all of you as well. And so we call this a speedobotics uh, thing and if I, just turn this on, do a little, okay, I'll just hold it in the hand for a little bit of demo. And this robot is created again by an eight year old, just two days back in Delhi, within 30 minutes. And so we said, if, if people start doing this, then they will very quickly graduate from something like this to building something like that. And that's another initiative that we've taken up with, with creating this speedobotics kit. So, with those things in mind, uh, we, uh, we, I really encourage you to you know, get into this robotics field. We have our speedobotics thing and you can explore other things as well. And, and then finally, okay, I want to thank our team. So even though I get to speak here, a lot of our initiatives are very, heavily supported by our core team, as well as our partners, uh, including Jabong, Alibi, and Atrim. And we want to thank you all for that. And I want to encourage all you folks to take up robotics. And if you uh, have any interest in them, feel free to get in touch with us. Thank you. <laughs>